This conference will now be recorded. Welcome everyone, and let's start our quiz. I just want to show you something there because I still have queries um, from the candidate. I can't reach the uh, topic-wise mock test. So what you will do, simply will go to the question bank, okay, and you scroll down, 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 okay, till the um, here in this section. As you can see, this is mock based on books and recalls, verified recalls. Okay, click the number one mock based on books and recalls. Okay, and here it will appear to you. Okay, so just please take care. Yeah, so from this one, we are going to continue on the VTE mock. Okay, yeah. and here is also the mock series. Uh, of the hypertension, okay? So let's choose the VTE mock first. And of course, this is different from the module-wise mock test that we uh, used to discuss or we advise you guys to go through it, okay? The module-wise means that in the question bank under the module of the antenatal care or maternal medicine, you will find a mock test, but this is uh, would be on the whole module, not a topic wise. Okay, so last time I have received the question. Uh, yeah, this is for the question number nine, which we have already explained. I think we have finished 10 questions, but I will go back uh, to the question number nine again and explain it, okay? So my friends, uh, we said here for the 31-year-old woman presented at 34 weeks of gestation with twin pregnancy and with pain in her right cuff, okay? So when you have pain in the right cuff, you suspect that could be a DVT, okay? So of course, there is some differential diagnosis, but the uh, most important one, the most serious that you need to deal with is the DVT. She's a smoker and her body mass index is 34. At booking on examination, she had bilateral varicose vein and right-sided superficial thrombophlebitis. Okay, so we can see here that there is this patient that she had risk factors. Um, age is 31, so not a risk factor. She had twin pregnancy, okay, and she's a smoker and body mass index is 34. So what is her score now? She had also bilateral varicose vein, okay? And she did. She is not on a low molecular weight heparin, otherwise he will tell you, right? Doppler studies report normal vacancy of the deep venous system of both legs. She had a family history of antithrombin-3 deficiency. So what are you going to do now? If the Doppler has ruled out that DVT, can you start the hair on a therapeutic dose or the prophylactic dose will be just fine. Okay, so this case will be enough for her to have a prophylactic. Okay, so I, I just want to ask you guys because this is maybe the cause of the difficulty. The, uh, you know, the confusion in this question. If I have a patient who is 31 years old, single tone pregnancy, her BMI is normal, and she came with right cuff muscle pain, okay, and I suspect that this could be a DVT, we have run the doubler and the doubler says that nothing is there. Do I need to start any low molecular weight heparin in this case for her? Based on her risk assessment? No, I don't, right? Because she doesn't have a risk factor for me, right? Age is okay, BMI is okay, single tone pregnancy, nothing is there. But our patient here, she had risk factors, okay? So we should offer her the prophylactic dose. She should have it from earlier, but let's say you have a patient came to your clinic at 31, 32 or anything, and you think that this patient VTI risk is three or four, of course start now, okay? This is better than nothing. So I hope that this is now is clear. And when we go to the options, 
we will see only that we have the option of prophylactic dose in which one is it n or g for example what do you think which one have the prophylactic dose g h or n Okay, yes, so we have itch. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so now we'll move to the question number 11. I think we have done 10 questions last time. So let's see. Yes, well done, everyone. So we have in the question number 11, 25 year old woman who is 28 in pregnancy and being treated for confirmed deep vein thrombosis. Okay. Okay. Is the voice clear, everyone? Okay, thank you very much. So my friend who had problem with the voice, please check your site, your internet. Okay, thank you very much. I know sometimes difficult, but Also, there is another advice that you look out, okay, and look in again. I'm so sorry, I can't help more in this. Okay, so this is now number 11. We have the 28 pregnant treated for confirmed deep vein thrombosis, and she had weight of 95. Her second deep this is her second deep vein thrombosis in the last five years so she had a, a recurrence this case and the hematologist require an investigation on this patient so what do you think what is the most appropriate investigation for this scenario before we go to the option we have to think what would be the best for her she had already treatment for confirmed deep vein thrombosis now he's requesting more investigation. So what do you think, what investigation should be done now? Any answers, my friend? Okay, so anti-XA, okay, looks like a good answer. Okay, why? Why we would choose this patient? Now she have this, our patient here, she is having weight of 95 and she had a recurrence as well. So do we need to do, do we need to monitor her dose? Yes, this is, yeah. So this is an indication to monitor the dose, okay? so. The monitoring for the low molecular weight heparin and the patient who had extreme body weight or deranged kidney function or recurrent. So this will be the anti-XA or anti-factor 10A. Okay, yes, well done. Let's see the question number 12. And the question number 12 says 37 year old primary and she is 102 kg, BMI 40, seen in the antenatal clinic for booking. She had conceived following long period of subfertility and through assisted conception. Okay, uh, ultrasound had been done and confirmed dichorionic diaminotic twin of 11 plus 5. Reflective low molecular retiberine has been given throughout the pregnancy. Category 3, cesarean section has been performed at the 37. What is recommended? as best practice for regard to reducing maternal risk in VTE in the uh, preparium period, the postpartum. So what do you think for this patient? There is two ways, okay, to think about this question. One is to think about the postnatal uh, scoring system and the other one, okay, 
that if the patient is receiving antenatal low molecular weight heparin, then it's logically that I can continue uh, with her, right? Six weeks postpartum, right? Right? So you think that this is a correct answer? Yeah, okay, so let's have a, yeah, let's have a look here. What would be the best answer from the options? I'm sorry, the option is a bit scattered. Okay. Low molecular weight heparin 20 mg per day, low molecular weight heparin 60 per day for seven days, prophylactic low molecular weight heparin 60 per day for six weeks postnatal, TED stocking mobilization hydrate, hydration and therapeutic low molecular weight heparin seven days. So what do you think? I'm just waiting the answers, guys. Okay. Okay, so you guys agree for six weeks postnatal, right? Yeah, and of course, that's we will go to the dose of 60, not 20, right? Yeah, so I agree that this is the best answer for you. A 26-year-old primary discussing her fears of pregnancy complication with you at the booking visit. She had heard that pregnancy and childbirth increase risk of thromboembolism. You will uh, be correct to tell her that the incidence of VTE in pregnancy and postpartum is. This is a number, so easy to remember. Okay. So you, you guys agree that B is the correct? I'm not very good at answers, so you need to help me.
Okay, so you guys, you give me three answers. Okay, so what do you think of the background risk? Don't don't go to read anything, the options. Just try to remember what is the risk. Okay, so if we go to the part of the guideline that speak about the epidemiology, you know that in every guideline there will be um, part of the introduction and background epidemiology. And usually your questions uh, when they come in the part of you know uh, asking you about percentage and numbers and all, it all comes from this introduction, okay? From the introduction and background epidemiology. So. So pulmonary embolisma has remained the leading direct cause of maternal death in the UK. There was significant fall in the maternal mortality rate from the pulmonary embolism. Okay, so this is reduced from 1.65 per 10, no, not 100,000 maternities. Okay, so now I can see that they speak about the pulmonary embolism first. Okay, and this is good because a VTE application, you know, the prophylaxis had dropped the number and helped them. Okay, so the National Institute of Health Care and Excellency estimate that the low molecular weight heparin reduced the VTE risk in medical and surgical patient by 60 to 70 percent, okay, respectively. Okay, so in the exams, they ask this question. It comes about the, what is the um, rate of prevention of low molecular weight heparin. So if the patient had received the low molecular weight heparin, does this guarantee that this patient will not have a VTE? No, okay? But it will be sixty percent if she is a medical patient, seventy percent for surgical patient. okay? So, it's not 100%. That's very important. And also for the oral exam, they like to ask this question so much. So this is an important number from this introduction. What, is, what else comes here? Okay, so let's see. Seventy-nine percent and eighty-nine percent of the women who died from the PE in the UK between 2003 and 2005 are between 2006 and eight. Okay, had identifiable risk factor and similar proportion. Seventy percent of the UK obstetric surveillance system. This is the UK's. The coast. Okay, have okay PE and they have identifiable risk factor. This is okay. Good. Now let's have a see. Have a look here. The rate of PE is 1.3 per 10,000. This is another number that you can have it. Okay. Also, the relative risk of VTE in pregnancy is increased four to six fold and increased further in the postpartum. Okay. So now I have this four to six fold increasement. The absolute risk is low and overall incidence in VTE of pregnancy and postpartum is 1 to 2 in 1,000. Absolute incidence of VTE in pregnancy and postpartum is 107 per 100,000 person per year in the UK. Okay, so what was our question says? Do you remember our question? Let's have a look here. Okay, sorry. Our question says that you have 26 year old primary and discussing her fear of pregnancy complication with you at the booking visit. She had heard that pregnancy and childbirth increase the risk of the thromboembolism. You will be correct to tell her that the incidence of VTE in the pregnancy and postpartum is. Now, is it clear for you guys? What is the answer? 
it's B, right? So B here is the correct answer. I have just went through this for you guys because I have seen that you are confused and overall people say I'm confused between C and D. Okay, so guys, there is no you know, place for confusion. This is a number, just go check the epidemiology, find the number, this is the correct one and that's it, okay? So B is the answer, okay? Okay. For the previous question, I have uh, my friend asking me, asking about the previous question. Previous question answer was C, dear. Okay. For a patient who had received the antenatal thromboprophylaxis, so the answer should be C only. Now we have another EMQ. Let's have a look to this EMQ. What it says? For each of the following clinical scenarios, select the most appropriate next step in the management. Okay, so when he say next step in the management, that means that uh, he wants from you the action that you will take now if you are in the hospital. So let's see. 34-year-old patient seen in the obstetric triage unit out of the hour. Out of hours means it's, a, you know, away from the um, 8 to 5. This is the... Uh, hour okay uh, of working in the uk so after that it's called out of hours she is 26 weeks of gestation with acute pain tenderness and swelling of her left leg she is otherwise well with no chest pain or shortness of breath so what will be the next step that you will do here the problem in the woman she has suspected dvt so what should be the next step in the suspected dvt Shall you start on treatment? Shall you start on investigation? So here you don't have a clue what, what to choose. Is it treatment or investigation? You know that this patient will require treatment, but if there is any safety step before I prescribe the treatment, There is anything that I want to check before I prescribe the treatment? I will do a full blood count, urea, electrolytes, and coagulation test. Why? Because before I start the low molecular weight heparin for this patient, I need to check that she doesn't have a contraindication like for example deranged uh, function or bleeding tendency or very low platelet count right so this is a safety point before i start low molecular weight heparin so why didn't i choose the compression duplex ultrasound guys the question is next step in the management next step in the management is the thing that you will do if you are in the hospital right now and this will be your next move okay you will not await the compression double x ultrasound to start the treatment we start the treatment and then the compression double x ultrasound done and if the compression double x ultrasound confirms the dvt we continue the treatment if it is not we stop the treatment right okay so if i been asked what is the most appropriate treatment i will advise low molecular weight heparin as answer if i've been asked what is the most sensitive or specific investigation that will help me reach a diagnosis or confirm or defend the diagnosis in this case i will go to the compression duplex ultrasound Next step is the thing that I will do clinically if I'm in the clinic or in the liver room or in the triage unit. This will be my next action. Now, I want to give the patient low molecular weight heparin. I'll ask the nurse to collect blood from her, the triage nurse, or test the blood for the full blood count, urea electrolytes, liver function test, coagulation profile before I give the first dose of the heparin low molecular with heparin for this patient okay guys so 
the heading of the question is the most important thing. That's why we say part two is like, you know, equations. It's like math. It's like chemistry. Okay. They give you something. They want something specific. So if I change this, okay, answer change. If I change it, the leading sentence in the question, the answer changed. Okay, and this is the game of the EMQ. That's why the EMQ is the highest, you know, uh, question level of the question that tests your deep knowledge and understanding. Okay, so. Let's see the next one. Next one is a 38-year-old patient is seen at to 22. 22 weeks of gestation with acute swelling and pain in the right cuff. She had she was started on a therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin and a Doppler ultrasound scan is negative for deep vein thrombosis. She remains symptomatic yet. Okay, so the patient, guys, have a look with me. She is 22. Try to understand the situation before you advise anything. 22. She had a acute swelling and pain. She had received already the low molecular weight heparin, but the Doppler ultrasound came as negative. What you will do? She is remain symptomatic. When we say remain symptomatic means that this is a high suspicion of clinical diagnosis of a DVT. Tell me what you will do. This patient should continue on a medication on the low molecular weight heparin or stop. Yes, you will stop. Okay, shall I repeat the investigation for this patient or no need? Yeah, we know from the guideline that if the investigation came negative in the DVT, I stop the treatment, right? Okay, but the next question is, shall I repeat investigation or not? This will depend on the clinical presentation clinical presentation is still symptomatic, then I, yes, I will repeat. When shall I repeat? At day three and day seven, right? Okay, so which one is the nearest one to, to the truth here, to the true answer? Stop treatment and repeat scan in three days, right? Yes, M, excellent, everyone. Okay, so let's move to the next. 18-year-old patient at 35 weeks of gestation, she presented with chest pain. Once I have chest pain, that means I have suspected pulmonary embolism, and this is life-threatening, right? Shortness of breath. She had sinus tachycardia, and chest X-ray is normal. Laboratory investigation, normal, and she had been started on low molecular weight heparin. Okay, so do you remember the algorithm? Do you remember the algorithm, my friend? I hope so. So, for the patient who had suspected pulmonary embolism, no DVT apparently from the question. So, I will depend on the chest X ray now. Chest X ray is normal. When the chest X ray is normal, what will be the next step? Vic. Yes, excellent. This is the ventilation perfusion VQ scan. Excellent. Okay, when the chest X ray is abnormal, I remember the CTV A. A was abnormal, right? So, excellent. Well done. So, here we will go for the VQ scan. Is there any contraindication to the VQ scan in this scenario? No. So, fine. Go to it. Okay, so my friend, let's have a look again. 18, a 42-year-old patient seen at 18 weeks of gestation with chest pain, mild shortness of breath, and swollen left leg. Okay, so the patient had chest pain and DVT, pulmonary embolism and suspected DVT. Baseline investigation include blood, chest X-ray, ECG, normal. She had a duplex ultrasound the same day that confirmed left-sided femoral DVT. Okay, so when I have confirmed DVT, what shall I do? 
Do I need to run further scan? Do I need to do uh, a VQ scan now? Or shall I continue treatment? Yes, excellent, well done. So I will continue treatment in this case. Yes, so where is the answer that continue treatment? No need to be scan. And by the way, there is one answer here says uh, continue treatment and repeat scan in seven days. Is it correct? No, I have confirmed it. No need to do any scans. Okay. okay, so what is the correct answer now? Yeah, K start the therapeutic dose. Okay, is she is on. Did she received anything? No. Okay. Good. So yes, start on the treatment. Actually, they should have started from the beginning. I don't know really uh, why this question is not very well written. Anyway. We don't argue the examiner. We just uh, answer according to the equations that we know, according to the fact and guideline. So let's have a look. Yes, you are correct, guys. Answer is K. So 19. 19 is a, 30, a 23, sorry, year old referred by the midwife at 38 with um, chest pain and shortness of breath. Okay, so the patient is 38 weeks. And by the way, very near. Uh, I think it, it was yesterday and, and day before yesterday. There was a case in the part two, uh, part three exam, sorry, the OSCE exam about a case who developed the VTE and she is 37 plus eight, uh, plus six, so almost 38. Um, this patient, she presented with symptoms of VTE. What agent you will start for her? Will you start on the low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin? What do you think? Unfractionated, yes, excellent, well done. Yes, the unfractionated heparin, why? She's near delivery, okay? How can I control low molecular weight heparin, right? So unfractionated heparin for the patient who presented with a VTE event near to the delivery, right? So now I have 38 weeks of gestation with chest pain and short net of press, right? Okay, so with the short net of press, I have pulmonary embolism suspected, okay? So the symptom resolved, uh, now it's resolved, okay? And CTB scan report status, no evidence of impulse in the segmental or subsegmental pulmonary tree, unable to exclude smaller peripheral impuli on a CTBA. Okay, so what do you think now? What shall I do for this case? Shall I continue treatment or shall I stop? You make your life very easy, actually, by the radiology report. What what is the patient okay? What was the patient presenting complaint? This presented with chest pain. What shall I do? Okay, if the investigation came as normal. Again, I need to go back to see, is it a high risk with clinical suspicion or low risk? Okay. Yeah. 
clinically now, what is the, this patient risk, guys? Is it a high risk or low risk? Yes, my friend, it's a pulmonary embolism, right? Pulmonary embolism is something serious. If the patient remains symptomatic, I must continue even if the all investigation normal, right? Right, so this is if the patient remains symptomatic. Now the patient symptoms resolved. Look here. If the clinical suspicion of PE is low, discontinue and consider alternative diagnosis. Why it's low? Because the symptoms resolved and there is change in the situation, right? If the clinical suspicion of PI is high, high means that she is still showing these signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism. Then consider alternative or repeat testing and continue low molecular weight variant. So if I have high clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolism, I can't say that investigation are normal, so I will stop or discontinue the low molecular weight variant. No, I have high clinical suspicion and no investigation is 100% sensitive, right? So this is for the high clinical suspicion. What if that low clinical suspicion? Low clinical suspicion, I always give example, like for example, the clinical picture changed, okay? Like it become now more clear that there's something else. Like for example, the patient had developed um, uh, fever, okay? Uh, or the investigation confirmed that this was something else, like this is MI, okay, anything. But now this is not a pulmonary embolism. Okay. So symptoms resolved. Investigation came as normal. What you would do? Back to the case. Symptoms resolved. No evidence of impulse on the segmental or subsegmental pulmonary tree, unable to exclude smaller peripheral impulse on the CTBA. This is something technical, okay? So any CTBA will not be able to exclude smaller peripheral impulse. Okay, so I stopped treatment. Shall I repeat investigation in this case? Or shall I consider alternative? I should consider alternative, right? Okay, so this patient, I will not continue treatment. I will not repeat investigation. So which answer will be the most appropriate answer now? And he said appropriate next step in management. So the thing that you will arrange for her now. Is it arterial blood gas? No. Compression double X ultrasound? No. Continue treatment and repeat in, se in seven days? No, I don't need to continue treatment or repeat. CTBA? No. D-dimer? No need. ECG, chest X-ray? No. Full blood count? No. Magnetic resonance? No. Refer back to midwifery lit care? Can I choose this one? Yeah, this is the thing that she is referred by the midwife. Now symptoms resolved. CTBA normal. Refer back to the midwifery. Let care. Clear? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So let's have a look here on the question number 20. What is the leading sentence here in this EMQ? For each of the following clinical scenarios, select the most appropriate form of thromboprophylaxis. 
Okay, so they need a treatment, a drug treatment. Let's have a look. 29 year primary, known to be heterozygous for factor 5V laden. Okay, she had no other risk factor. So, what do you think? She is primary, right? She's heterozygous. She's 29. So what do you think for this patient? What you need to do? Do I need to give her anything antenatal? No. Okay. So, do I need to do anything for her right now? Anything to be given postnatal? Okay, so let's have a look, my dear friends. Okay, on the table again, asymptomatic thrombophilia. Okay, considered as one risk factor, right? If she had significant family history of VTE, what shall I do? Six weeks postnatal, okay? He here he didn't tell me anything about risk factor or family history, other risk factor. Okay. So this patient, you think that she had any other risk factor? No, he said no other risk factor, so nothing. Okay, good. So nothing is required for her. I need someone of you, my dear friend, someone to volunteer, okay? So maybe I'll ask Dr. Ibrahim if you can. Dr. Ibrahim, could you please help me? Hello? Okay, I'll, what I will do is, I'll ask you, my friend, please, okay, to note any different question answer in the key from what we are solving here. So I will ask Dr. Nada to update the key. Okay. Please, Dr. Rava. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, why not uh, I is the answer? Why not I? Prophylactic dose, uh, low molecular weight. Uh, one week postnatally because she is hemozygous. Uh, okay, so my dear friend, do you have any recommendation in the guideline now for one week postnatal? She is uh, asymptomatic, uh, low risk uh, thrombophilia. Okay, so what is the, what's her score? Uh, one. One, okay. So, what we will mm. do postnatal? Yes, uh, uh, elastic stocking, a thromboprophylactic stocking, one week postnatally. Yes, avoid dehydration, yes. Okay, so mm. we will give her, yes, we will give her other measures rather than the low molecular weight heparin. If she is having other risk factors, then we will do the combination or the calculation. If the risk factor is family history, then in this case, the equation is changed. And right. the family history six weeks plus one, week. yes, leads to six weeks. So here, my dear friend, look, this is in the last table here in this section of the postnatal, okay? We yes. see the, uh, each one of these will be considered as one one risk factor. Include low risk thrombophilia. So low risk thrombophilia, okay? would be counted as 111, okay? So mm. four or more risk factor prophylaxis from the first trimester, okay? So let, this is the 
action that we will take for this patient, right? Okay. In the in the postnatal as well, okay, it is still the same in the postnatal uh, algorithm. So low risk thrombophilia. This means if I have this is one plus any other risk factor other than the family history, I will go to the 10 days postnatal. Okay. So if there is two or three, I will go to 10 days postnatal. If there is family history, I will go to six weeks. Otherwise, it's one risk factor. Nothing to be done. Okay, dear. Because I, I'll tell you why the, the answer is uh, different from, uh, you know, uh, older question. Because the guideline was different. Okay. So the guideline before this version that we are dealing with was different. And there was uh, a nice guideline of VTE thromboprophylaxis. So it was different in the recommendation. That's why all their question, you will find different answers. But what we do is we update. Okay, we update the answer according to the source we have. So when we when we depend on a previously cool question or a previous question from a book or something, it help us to be familiar with the scenarios with the way how the question is written, the topic, the trick in the question. But the key, go back to the source always, okay? Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. So when we have the question 21, is 24 year old primary? who has no history of thromboembolism, but is known to be homozygous for factor uh, V-laden. She had no other risk factor. So what do you think? Now, she had no history of thromboembolism, but she is homozygous. Homozygous is a higher risk or lower risk thrombophilia. Hi, okay, so for what is the recommendation for the high risk? The recommendation for the high risk was that six weeks recommended, six weeks postnatal, and consider antenatal from 28, or according to the overall risk, according to the case, of course, right? So in asymptomatic high risk, thrombophilia, protein C or S deficiency, or uh, those were with more than one thrombophilia defect, including homozygous or homozygous prothrombin gene mutation or, or compound heterozygous. And please remember, this is asymptomatic, means that she doesn't have any history. So recommend the six weeks postnatal, consider antenatal from 28, right? So there is no harm to go uh, when you solve the questions that you go like open book. So open your notes. Actually, I recommend that you are not now under any stress of the exam. So open your notes, open the question, and solve like this, okay? This is not a test mode. This is a learning mode, okay? Okay, well done. So a 28-year-old multiparous woman who had BMI of 42, but otherwise had no other risk factor. Okay, so again, again, BMI 42, what is the scoring for this patient? Two, okay, so postnatal she will receive how many days? 10 days, okay? However, I don't have the 10 days here in the option, but it's 10 days, okay? Looks like Dr. Nada, she had this question maybe from an older source or something, okay? So anyway, in the exam, you, you will have the 10 days, okay? Well done, okay. A 32-year-old multiparous woman who had a deep vein thrombosis in the last pregnancy, but no other risk factor. So, of course, the venous thrombosis in the previous pregnancy, what we will do right away, this is a high-risk patient. 
what shall I do? I will start from the beginning of the pregnancy, right? Antenatal, low molecular weight heparin. Do I need to give her the high dose or standard dose is enough? Back to our table. Standard dose, she doesn't have any other problem, right? If she had antiphospholipid syndrome or she had uh, thrombophilia, then we will consider for her the higher dose, right? Well done. Okay, so let's have a look here. A 27-year-old primary who had known to have antiphospholipid syndrome and the previous pulmonary embolism. Okay, that's very good. He is testing your knowledge on that point. Antiphospholipid and the previous pulmonary embolism. What shall I do? This is high dose or standard dose? This is high dose. Okay, high dose plus hematologist advice or expert. Very important. I need you to remember this. Right? What else shall I do for this case? the package of care that I will offer her. Anti-XA monitoring, okay. So this patient, she will be on a long-term anticoagulant. What do you think? She will continue on her live long-term anticoagulant. I'll tell you, for any patient who had ever had a pulmonary embolism plus a tendency like this, antiphospholipid syndrome, she should be on a long-term anticoagulant. In exam, usually they will give you a complete scenario, right? That he will give you that this patient, she is already on something like warfarin, okay? Or uh, reparoxipan, for example. So this patient in the pregnancy, she will have low molecular weight heparin from the beginning and once delivered, okay, she will continue uh, or we will go back again, we will bridge her again to the uh, an oral anticoagulant that she is on, okay. Okay, so the most important thing for me is I go to the table, refresh my knowledge, fix this picture into your mind, help your memory. Okay, help your brain remember very well in the exam. So, have a look here. Personal history of VTE, antiphospholipid syndrome. What shall I do? High dose low molecular weight heparin. Once pregnancy test is positive, till six weeks postpartum or until returning to oral anticoagulant therapy after delivery. Right? Okay, that's very well. So, let's have a collection of single best answers. What are the categories of body weight and that require routine measurement of peak anti-XA activity for women who are under treatment with low molecular weight heparin for acute VTE? So what, what was the category? The extremes of body weight, which one? Below 50 and above? 90, yes, excellent, yes, this is the category, yeah. 26, 25 year old woman presented at 12 weeks of gestation, four years earlier she presented with deep vein thrombosis after fracture, her femur and undergoing a major orthopedic operation. Her thrombophilia screen is result is negative, no family history of thrombosis and she had body mass index of 23. So this is, a VTE followed, following what? Following surgery, right? Okay, so what will be the answer? This is provoked on our table, it's here. Previous provoked VTE related to surgery. So I will start from 28 till six weeks, right? Well done. Okay, so last case, 38, 
gravity 3, para 2, admitted 32, feeling unwell. She had gradually becoming more anxious. The day with cough and chest pain, she had worse uh, during inspiration. Observation as follows, temperature 37.2, pulse 110, blood pressure 98 over 60, the is 24, and blood gas reveal mild respiratory alkalosis. What is the most appropriate management plan for her? What do you think? What do you think, guys, for this acute presentation? B, right? Okay. So perform urgent chest X-ray, ECG, comment the patient on a therapeutic low molecular with heparin, right? Yes, well done. Okay. So I hope that the discussion of this mini MOOC was helpful, guys, to fix the information of the VTE. Okay, shall we move now to the hypertension? My dear friend, just give me one second, please. Okay, or two minutes, okay, till I change my presentation and uh, change the topic, okay? I'll prepare also the hypertension. Thank you very much, okay? So consider it as mini break, two minutes only, okay? Thank you. This conference will now be recorded. So my friends, welcome everyone back again, and let's have a look to what is the important point in the hypertension. Um, that we would like to uh, focus on today okay so uh, the first question asking what did the postpartum hypertensive uh, advice in a black african lady with blood pressure 155 over 98 what is the recommended treatment so guys what do you think yes that's the nifedabin thank you very much so if he told you that this patient was well controlled on amlodipine. What you will do? You will go as you have been guided to, right? So choose amlodipine. Well done. If he said that she is from uh, UK, okay, and she is Caucasian, for example, and postnatal. Postnatal, what is the drug to be offered? Inalapril, well done. If he said that uncontrolled asthma or uncontrolled cough, so that's mean you avoid all the ACE family, right? Because it can cause a cough severe cough as well so then in this case you can go to the nifedibin as a second option right well done so a woman who had delivered at 35 weeks of gestation due to preeclampsia and has ongoing hypertension requiring treatment postpartum the woman suffered from asthma but has never been hospitalized okay what would be the most appropriate antihypertensive agent Yeah, so that's the same idea. So the thing, guys, that they like to repeat, okay? They like to repeat their things. 
but sometimes they just change the scenario a little bit for you, so it's the same. Yes, excellent. Clear concept, my friend. Well done. Now, if is that. Missile loba is often discontinued in the postnatal period due to the association with postnatal depression. What other side effect that can uh, often found with this medication in the postpartum period? Flushing and sedation. Okay. It's actually E. Okay. It's a safe option uh, in the treatment in the antenatal. Okay. But the problem in the postnatal period, it has uh, some problems like the uh, recurrence of hypotension, postnatal depression. Okay, so also sedation effect. That's why we need to stop it within 48 hours. Okay, of the delivery, this patient the, for uh, the methyl dopa. Even if the patient was in it on the antenatal, we need to stop it in the postpart because of the side effect. Right. So the answer is E. E. So the midwife is admitting a, a woman into a long side midwifery unit in your maternity hospital. What feature in her initial assessment that will warrant transfer of this low risk woman to the obstetric unit? Okay, so yeah, I know this information come from the intrapartum care guideline, but it's good that we mentioned here. Okay, so what will be the indication for transfer from a midwifery unit to the obstetric unit. If a patient has hypertension in labor, do you think that we will allow this patient to continue her delivery on the midwifery unit or shall we transfer her? We transfer here once we have reading of the high blood pressure that this patient, okay. Okay. High pulse rate, shall I await till to confirm the high pulse rate to occasion? So here is the high blood pressure, 140 over 90 is the indication. So C is the answer, okay? So if, we, if you have raised diastolic blood pressure of 90 or more or raised systolic blood pressure of 140 or more, I will not await, okay? This is two consecutive reading taking 30 minutes apart, okay? I will not await if I have a severe once I have a severe, I will not repeat. I will just go to the transfer immediately, okay? So for the patient who had severe, no repeat reading, okay? For the patient who had mild, 140 over 90, then I can repeat the reading. Once confirmed, I will transfer here. So the answer is C, this question. A pregnant lady at 12 weeks of gestation with a recurrent history of pregnancy induced hypertension had taken antihypertensive drug in the last pregnancy. What would you advise her? She had recurrent history of pregnancy induced hypertension. So she's high risk of developing this again. So what you will advise? Aspirin, right? So is it till 36 or till delivery? Till delivery. Yes. Okay, so a 37 year old primate of African origin with BMI of 38 attended the emergency department with shortness of breath, edema, and tachycardia. She had no proteinuria but admitted 
um, a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It become apparent that she is hypertensive 153 over 100 and need treatment prior to the investigation. What is the following antihypertensive that would be the most appropriate? Okay. So for a patient who attend to the emergency department with shortness of breath, what you will do? Which agent that you will offer? Okay, it's not about being in African origin, my friend. I now just ask you, okay, about the emergency for this case. The patient is primary gravidus. Is it a postnatal patient or it's an antenatal patient? This patient is postnatal or antenatal? Antenatal, okay. What is the medication number one in the antenatal? Slabitalol, okay. So, can I choose nifedipine for this case? I will tell you. Nifedipine is not the first in the antenatal, it's the second. However, this patient, she had a cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? Nifedipine can cause a vasodilatation, which should not be done in this case. Okay, so I will go to the lepitalol as first, as the rule says. Okay, is lepitalol suitable for cardiomyopathy? Yes, it's suitable. Okay, so it's C. The patient will receive other treatments, my dear, for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? Because here I'm not suspecting that she had um, a pulmonary embolism or anything. Even the choices that he given, that he is giving me is choices of hypertension, right? So I need to choose a hypertensive, antihypertensive agent. But this is not the only treatment that she will receive, of course. This is an emergency case and she will have a package of care. Prepartum cardiomyopathy is one of the topics that's become very important now for the exam and I think that you will have it with Dr. Nada as well in the cardiac disease of pregnancy. Okay, so a young Brimy attend the assessment unit at 32 weeks of gestation following an assessment of raised blood pressure by community midwife. Your protein creatinine is 32. Is it now past the threshold of the significant proteinuria? What do you think? Okay, so what is the blood pressure here? 152 over 102, so this is mild to moderate. What is the most appropriate management now? Yes, it's mild to moderate preeclampsia. So, what is the management now? Will you admit this patient or not?
anybody would like to admit this patient according to the NICE guideline? Okay, so why, why, my friend, you want to admit this patient? Tell me. Let's go back here to the nice guideline and see. This is for the preeclampsia, my friend. This is a table of the preeclampsia. Again, we have mild to moderate. Mild to moderate, what is the action? Regarding admission to the hospital, admit if there is clinical concern for the woman or baby, or there is high risk of adverse events suggested by the full fears or the PREPS risk prediction model. Do I have here any of this? Do I have a concern here? or just I have a preeclampsia. So we said, please, 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 in the NICE guideline, take care, admission for the patient who had concerns. And he mentioned the concerns and he give it to you. If there's no concern given for mild to moderate preeclampsia, no need to admit. Clear, Dr. Aisha? Okay, so now he said admit only if there is clinical concern, right? Okay, so what is else? Shall I start the treatment? Yes, I start the treatment. Shall I repeat? The blood pressure measurement, yes, at least every 48 hours. Dipstick proteinuria, shall I repeat dipstick proteinuria? Okay, blood test, shall I do blood test? Yes, I will do it twice per week. Okay, so let's have a look to the option and see what is the option that go in the same line with the NICE guideline. Admit and commence, not not admit. Admit, no. Okay, admit for observation, no. Discharge back to community midwife and advice for blood pressure and automated reagent strip for proteinuria, no, 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 no repeat. Proteinuria. Discharge back to community midwife and advice for blood pressure and urine protein creatinine ratio every 48 hours. Also, no. Okay. So, no, guys, this is no repeat for the quantification of proteinuria. Not this one and not this one. Okay. So, this patient, what should be the correct care for her? I guess this is again according to the previous guideline. Okay. So, my friend, what should be the management of hair? Dipstick only if clinically indicated, okay? Or uncertainty over diagnosis, so I don't need. Blood test, yes. So, blood test can be done every twice per week. Blood pressure repeat, yes, I, I will repeat the blood pressure. So, this is the care that I should do. D is not correct, Dr. Aisha. I can't see anyone, any, any correct answer here. Okay. I can't see any correct answer in this question. This is on the old guideline. Okay. So, again, guys, please take care with me. Okay. Please take care with me. Here, I will, if I choose, for example, E, I will remove the albumin creatinine ratio every 48 hours. This is not required. Okay. So it will be only blood pressure every 48 hour blood test will be repeated twice per week. No need for repeat proteinuria. If you go back to the D, discharge back to the community midwife and advice for blood pressure and the automated reagent strip. No, no, no. If you will advise, you will advise here the blood test 
twice per week. Okay, so again, question seven in this mock will need to correct. One second. In three mock, just leaving a message. <laughs> and hypertension question seven. So far, okay. Okay, guys. Yes. Thank you very much. Good that we have been through this together. Okay, and good also that you clear your concept. Okay, that's why I told you at the preparation phase, go to the guideline, revise the part that came in the guideline. So this is how you fix the information to your mind, okay? A patient with eclampsia received four gram magnesium sulfate and IV maintenance one gram per hour. After a few hours, the patient convulsed again. So what you will do again? Shall you give her hydrolazine or diazepam or phenytoin or repeat the polar dose? Simply, we will repeat. Yes, two to four mg. Yes, excellent. So the answer is A. In the question number nine, Brimy is seen for booking. She is 40 years and conceived through IVF. Ultrasound scan has confirmed the twin pregnancy, BMI 36. What treatment would you advise to reduce the risk of preeclampsia? That's easy. Aspirin, right? So aspirin here. And again, you know that it's now 150, but okay, we will accept the 75. 10, 31 year old, present to the antenatal clinic. When she is 22 weeks pregnancy, she had normal antenatal care until last visit two weeks previously with no medical history or medication. At this visit, the blood pressure is 145 over 89 and with significant proteinuria. What is your management? Mild to moderate preeclampsia. So, what you will do? Okay, so no concern. Good. What you will do? I will arrange for her community follow up. The community follow up will be 48 hours for the blood pressure measurement. What about the investigation? Twice per week. Do I need to repeat proteinuria? No need unless there is concern or uncertainty about diagnosis. So the answer is D. D because we say arrange for home blood pressure measurement every other day. Okay? Yes. So the answer is D. And the question 11, we have 17-year-old para-1 attending for postnatal follow-up six weeks after an emergency cesarean section for severe preeclampsia and health at 27 plus 2. The baby was severely growth restriction and is still in neonatal unit. What is her risk of preeclampsia in the future pregnancy? Para-1, okay. She had admitted six weeks postnatal. She had severe preeclampsia and was delivered 27 plus 2. Postnatal risk for this patient will be?
45 or 55. So yes, the one that Dr. Ibrahim helped with, yeah. E, right? Okay. So Mrs. P.O. is 27 year old, who is Gravida 1, Para 0, brought by ambulance, 35 weeks of gestation with history of headache, blurred vision, on arrival, had blood pressure 150 over 100, urine analysis 3 plus proteinuria, where you are assessing her, she had tonic clonic seizures, no history of epilepsy, what is the first step in her emergency management? So what do you think? Cesarean section, intravenous hydralazine, inform consultant, secure airway, or secure IV access and give bullet dose of magnesium sulfate bear protocol. What do you think? So the patient apparently she is in a fit and fit means that she need to have the magnesium sulfate. But the question is asking you, what is the first step that you will do? So what is the first thing you will do? Airway, right? A, B, C. Yes, excellent. Okay, so this is the correct one. Based on that, question, first step in the management. Excellent. Okay, you are admitting a 33-year-old with blood pressure 170 over 115. Urine to be stick 1 plus proteinuria. What is the quickest and most convenient method to quantify her proteinuria? Yeah, these questions actually it's very good to, you know, regarding the clinical management. So it's like testing your clinical man management and your abilities. Now we need to confirm, guys, wake up. This patient, she had one proteinuria, right? I need now to quantify the amount of proteinuria. What shall I choose according to the NICE guideline? There's two ways to quantify the significance of the proteinuria to know if it is reached the cutoff or not. I need the albumin creatinine ratio or the protein creatinine ratio, right? I need to choose one of these, right? So it's not about repeating now at all, because if confirmed that she had preeclampsia and there is significant proteinuria, I will not repeat, right? Yes, so this is C, answer is C. In the question 14, 34 weeks pregnant, low risk primary referred via the community midwife, Blood pressure 140 over 90. She had trace of proteinuria. Her booking BMI is 29. Fetal gross scan done showed a dominant circumference on the fifth centile and normal AFI and umbilical artery Doppler. What would be the most appropriate step in this point in her management? What do you think? What do you think, guys? So, everybody agrees? C. Antenatal day assessment unit for blood, blood pressure profile, PET, urine analysis, CTG, if that's factory, then midweek repeat ultrasound for Doppler. Okay. 
I don't agree anyway. Okay, first in Thailand, normally. Okay. Okay, so apparently C is a. Uh, okay, one second. Monitor comments are always a low for now. Comment. What discharge? No, should not be discharged. Okay. This is a problem here, okay, that I don't uh, really agree with. It is the repeat the scan. When shall we repeat the scan? When you will need to repeat the scan, guys, for a baby on the fifth centile, Doppler is normal and mother is hypertensive. Two weeks, okay? Yeah, okay. So th this is this is the thing that I, if you ask me, I would really, you know, modify in this question. Yeah, it should be done fortnightly. Okay, so the question 15. 30 years old, present at 12 weeks of gestation antenatal to review. She had one previous pregnancy. Last pregnancy had placental abruption at 32, requiring emergency cesarean and immediate postnatal period. She developed fulminating preeclampsia requiring IV infusion of labutalol and magnesium sulfate. It's otherwise well, and BMI today is 28. Blood pressure is 120 over 70. Dipstick show no abnormality. What is the most appropriate antenatal management? I think it's clear, right? The antenatal management here is clear. What you will do here? Aspirin, right? Well, anything else you would do? Okay, yes, aspirin is good. Okay, 16, you are conducting your antenatal care uh, ward round the previous evening. A previously fit and healthy 41, Brimey, at 33 weeks of gestation, was admitted due to elevated blood pressure and mild headache. Examination finding as follows, blood pressure 155 over 109. Okay, and this is almost severe. Then after that, settling after oral labitalone, single tone uh, phallic pregnancy, no abdominal tenderness, bundle height is 29, reflex is normal, no clonus, but pitting edema to knee bilateral urine, urine analysis show protein creatinine ratio of 0.5 mg. Okay, very minimal. Uh, cardiograph is normal. Blood result as follows hemoglobin 100, platelet 135. Uh, ALT is 23, urate is 384. She had commented on the levitalol 200 mg oral twice daily. So what do you think? What you will do for this case? Okay, so why we will need to do a cesarean section in this case? She is 33. She is 33, so what you will need to do now? You want to check for the fetal well-being, right? So do you need to do ultrasound now? Yes, so answer is... E, okay. 
that should be repeated, dear. That should be repeated, Dr. Delhi. But I but I can't advise just deliver her because I, I got belated 135. Especially that the ALT is 23. Okay. Forty-five year old woman being induced for preeclampsia at 36 weeks of gestation. The midwife booking looking after her asked for an urgent review as she is now complaining of severe headache and epigastric pain. On examination, blood pressure 140 over 90. She is hyperreflexic and four beats of clone. What is the next next most appropriate management for this woman? Magnesium sulfate, right? Okay. So here is asking you about when to stop the missile duba and the postnatal. Within how many days? In this question number 18. Within two days, right? Okay. So one in MQ. Each of the following clinical scenarios relate to severe hypertension in pregnancy. For each patient, select single most appropriate option from the list above. Each option may be used once, more than once, or not at all. 32-year-old woman at 37 weeks of gestation had an eclamptic seizure and currently receiving treatment with intravenous labetalol. Magnesium sulfate infusion has been running for the last six hours. Blood pressure 150 over 100, urine output 200 in the four hours. Blood result within normal. She's now had a second eclamptic seizure. So the management is easy now. What you will do for second eclamptic seizure? I need to repeat the bolus dose two to four, right? Okay. Yes, so now let's see number 20. A 42 year old has been admitted at 33 weeks of gestation, vomiting, subsequently found to have severe preeclampsia. She is known asthmatic on treatment with inhaled salbutamol and steroid. Blood pressure is 170 over 100. And urine output is 140 ml in the last four hours. Her platelet count is 100 over 100. Uh, sorry, uh, is 100 and appears well and her deep dental reflex are normal. So what you will do? Vomiting subsequently found to be severe preeclampsia, asthmatic, blood pressure 170, 110, urine output is okay, but it is 100. So what you will do for her? Can I use labetalol for hair? No, of course, no. Good. Okay, so what will be the next? What is the next after labetalol, oral and IV? Next is nifedibin, oral, right? Can be considered. But shall I give her oral nifedipin? Shall I go for it? No, she's vomiting. The patient presented with vomiting. Okay, so what shall I do now? Hydrolysine, right? Yes, so correct. So now I need to give this patient a hydrolazine. And I need to remember that with the hydrolazine, a preload of less than or maximum 500 ml crystalloid will be used, right? So this is the answer. 
A 24-year-old woman at 32 weeks of gestation attended the midwifery led care unit and found to have blood pressure 156 over 106. This makes it moderate, but towards a severe side. Okay, so let's have a look to the rest of the case. Urine testing was automated by agent strep, proteinuria 2 plus, and the spot urinary protein creatinine ratio of 30. 30 is that? threshold, right? Okay, so what you will do for this patient? What shall I do based on the NICE guideline, my friend? Shall I admit this patient? Okay, so is Outpatient management with labetalol is okay. Yes, seems okay. okay. So guys, please take care because NICE guideline is different in this preeclampsia management mild to moderate in the point of admission, in the point of follow-up, need to repeat the proteinuria or not. And as you can see, there's a lot of question testing this point, okay? So be careful of the tables. Okay, so let's have a look here. And I guess, yeah. Yeah, this is the frequencies, okay. This is a good EMQ. For each of the following scenarios, select the single most appropriate frequency to monitor the requested parameter. Good, direct question. 33-year-old in her first pregnancy at 34, she had blood pressure of 164 over 108 and treated with oral lepidolol as inpatient. Her urinary creatinine is 26, so 26 is it, this is protein creatinine, okay? Is it significant proteinuria? Okay, so we are now dealing with gestational hypertension. When the patient is admitted in patient, what is the frequency of repeating proteinuria? Daily while admission. Yes, excellent, excellent. Very well done. Okay, 23. A 28-year-old woman in her first pregnancy at 32 weeks with blood pressure 154 over 103 with urinary protein creatinine ratio of 22. Treatment, so again, still hypertension. Treatment with lapidolol is commenced. How often the blood pressure should be checked? Simple, simple, simple to fix the information, to go to the guideline and have a look. Mild to moderate gestational hypertension. What shall I do? Blood pressure once or twice per week, right? Good. Okay, so have a look here. Yes, this is the answer. So, 36 year old and her second pregnancy with dichorionic diamniotic twin at 32 weeks of gestation. What is the story? Okay, blood pressure 150 over 98 on two occasions. Urinary protein creatinine ratio is high, it's 89. Initial blood test for the full blood count, your electrolyte LFTs are normal. How often the blood test will be repeated for this patient? What do you think? Twice or three times per week with the significant proteinuria that she had? That's twice, excellent, okay. So, yes, twice. So 29 year old in the first pregnancy have been diagnosed with severe gestational hypertension at 30 weeks of gestation. She had ultrasound scan that show normal gross amniotic fluid and a molecular artery doppler. How often the scan should be repeated assuming that the, everything is stable? Severe gestational hypertension. Severe gestational hypertension, we usually deal with it as a preeclampsia, you know? So, 
I mean in the frequency of repeat testing. So see here what you will do for the repeat scan, carry out, carry out the ultrasound assessment of the fetal at the time of diagnosis. If normal, repeat every two weeks. If severe, hypertension, hypertension resist, right? Okay, good. Okay, last question. For each of the following scenario, choose a single most appropriate pharmacological management from the list of options above. Each option may be chosen once, more than once, or not at all. A 39-year-old is seen in the postnatal ward just prior to discharge. She had forceps delivery two days before. She is planning to continue breastfeeding for at least six months, and she suffered with chronic hypertension, and she's taking enalapril prior to pregnancy. Her medication was changed to methyl doba. Okay, so what you will do now? She was in, a, in, a, in a lapril. Then shall I go back to it postnatal? Yes. Okay. So what do you have to choose? Switch to in April. Okay. Good. In the 42, 42 year old with chronic hypertension seen in the booking clinic at 12 weeks of gestation, she was taking low sartan prior to pregnancy and was switched to labetalol once she had positive pregnancy test at five weeks of gestation. So what you will do? Shall this patient continue on the low sartan? She was switched to Lepitalol already. Yes, of course, I will start low dose aspirin. Yes, of course, low dose aspirin is at 12 weeks. Okay, so yes, a woman is seen in the obstetric day assessment unit at 28 weeks of gestation. She is generally fit and well. She had been referred to her community midwife because the blood pressure is resistantly 150 over 100. There is no proteinuria. So what you will do, this is resistant. 150 over 100, what you will do? For any patient with gestational hypertension, what is the treatment that I will start here? Yes, labetalol, of course. Labetalol is the agent of a choice. Yes, well done. So my friend, I think that we have finished here today. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your time and thank you very much for joining me. Um, I am providing this guidance for you as you are a July candidate, you are now um, preparing. So I'm trying to help. So you prepare well, please. Okay. 
and try to you know adopt my method in the you know on the solving question this is a skill and you have to work on it okay and with time you will be very good at solving the question so the way you read the scenario the way you analyze the question the options and choose uh, the best of it this is how you will inshallah solve the emq right in the exam okay so um, that's why i'm helping okay now in the you know while you are preparing of course in the towards the end or towards the revision in may we will go to the questions one by one and we'll solve so many questions but at the beginning now i need to fix everything and i need that everyone has a clear concept on how to approach the question scenarios okay thank you very much yeah, I'll make sure, Dr. Rania, that everything is updated on the website. Thank you. And also, I will leave a message to Dr. Nada to update the key answer in this mock test. Thank you very much.